for coming here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you for coming here. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you for the uh, second session of the uh, uh, SIEMS conference, which is going to be the session on cyber physical uh, systems. We are going to have uh, uh, four papers. The uh, first one is full, then we have two short papers, and the last one is an artifact paper. Uh, and we will organize it the, the same way as we did for the uh, first uh, session. So I would like to kindly ask you for your pitches. And please keep in mind that those pitches are really five minutes, not more. So thank you. Just, just go ahead. So Charlie, if you could start, please. Sure. Uh, OK, so my name's Charlie Hartzell. And today I'll be talking about uh, Resonate, which uh, the last question on the, the keynote was actually a good segue about risk, because uh, Resonate is a runtime risk assessment framework for autonomous systems. So uh, Ch Charlie, uh, if you want to share your screen, then you should. Oh, sorry, it's not sharing. Okay, how about now? Yeah, perfect. We can see your screen. Okay, Wonderful. Great. Um, so, uh, first, just a quick introduction. So, safety risk management is a pretty uh, common approach in the safety assurance of, of several domains now. Um, so, it's it's necessary to show when you're trying to show that an autonomous system is safe uh, that you've identified the hazards, the risks from those hazards. Uh, and you've put in control measures and mitigations in place to reduce those risks down to an acceptable level. Uh, so typically a risk matri matrix approach is common, like you see here on the right, where you define risk as a product of severity and probability. Uh, and then again, the control measures would take you from an initial risk and you try to reduce that down to a lower risk. So the conventional techniques use uh, static design time risk estimates. Uh, so this kind of covers the entire uh, operating region for the, uh, the the system in question. But the static estimates really kind of insufficient for highly autonomous or highly adaptive systems uh, where they can change quite a lot at runtime. So to address this, we introduced Resonate, which is a framework that calculates the probability of consequences dynamically based on the state of the system and or the environment. So this is kind of a flow chart for how Resonate works. It's divided into two parts, design time on the left, and runtime on the right. So at design time, you first start with your typical system analysis and hazard analysis where you identify those hazards and risks. Uh, and then you describe that hazard propagate, propagation using a bow type model. Uh, so we'll get into a little more on that in just a moment. But uh, these three steps in themselves are not particularly new. So, however, with Resonate, we then also calculate uh, conditional probabilities in this bow tie. So we determine uh, the barriers here, the blue blocks or the mitigations, the control strategies you've put in place. Uh, so we look at, we try to determine conditional probabilities from data on how effective those barriers are in certain, in different situations. Uh, so we then, send all this information over to our run, uh, Resonate Runtime Risk Computation at runtime. So this is the component that will actually at runtime take in the bow tie models as well as other observations such as sensor observations, uh, any hypotheses about fault modes that may be present, any other runtime monitors you may have available. And from all of that and the conditional probabilities in the bow tie table in the bow type model, it will try to calculate a dynamic risk estimate. And then you can use that dynamic risk estimate to make decisions. So this shows an example bow type model for an autonomous car. Uh, we had a couple of threats in this case, pedestrians crossing the road or a vehicle in our path of travel. Uh, we have some barriers that can prevent that threat from becoming a top event. A top event is a slightly more serious event where we're now approaching a roadway obstruction unsafe with unsafe speed. And then we had a final line of defense, which is an emergency braking system uh, that'll override if, if it detects we're about to collide. And if that also fails, then we might have a consequence. Uh, so you can see how the bow tie model kind of captures the hazard propagation and how certain relatively benign events can escalate to more serious consequences. So like I mentioned, each one of these barriers in the, in the diagram, which represents a control strategy, uh, has a conditional probability associated with it. And we estimate those probabilities from simulation data and to come up with these kinds of plots like you see here on the left, which is a relationship between a particular runtime monitor or what we call an assurance monitor and the probability of barrier failure. And then we, uh, 
So, okay. Uh, so this is the autonomous vehicle example here. And the actual runtime or the resume risk estimation is this plot right here with the red line. And you can see when we inject a camera occlusion, this vehicle is navigating based on three, four looking cameras. Uh, we'll see our risk score goes up because our occlusion detector is detected uh, that yes, the camera is occluded. Our assurance monitor is also detecting an anomaly here. And so our risk to the system goes up and risk here again being the estimated likelihood of a collision in this case. Now, once the fault clears, uh, then you'll see the risk score comes back down and the vehicle is able to continue on its way. Uh, so I don't think we really have time to go into any details about the validation, but we did try to validate that the estimated risk scores do match the observed number of collisions we saw in simulation. Uh, and if you have a chance to see the full 15 minute presentation on Clouder, then uh, you can see a little bit more detail about all that. So thank you for listening. Excellent, thank you very much. So we continue with the second paper, which I believe is Sebastian. Can you share your screen? Unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, you can see my screen, go ahead. So um, welcome everyone. My name is um, Sebastian Nervens. I'm doctoral researcher at Kloster University of Technology. It's a small university in the Harz Mountains in Germany. And I wrote this paper together with my colleague, Benjamin Leiding, and it's called the Hitchhiker's Guide to the End of Life for Smart Devices. And we are going to present a novel um, approach towards how to deal with electronic waste um, in the future, since we have pretty bad recycling rates in Germany and in other European countries. Um, so shortly, um, the motivation for a paper, it's um, the Sadly, record um, of e-waste, we had in 2019, um, 53,6 million of tons of um, electric waste uh, generate, um, generated worldwide. Um, well, every year it comes more and more. And there's already one problem with the term e-waste, to be honest. Um, in Germany, we call it um, old electric devices, which is maybe not a better term, but at least it is not called waste because um, electric and electronic devices and it contains a lot of valuable raw materials, such as gold, silver, and cobalt, for example. Um, 100, um, 100 kilograms of, um, um, of, um, of e-waste um, contains more than 100 times more um, of gold um, as uh, normal gold tons, um, gold ore, sorry. Um, when we were motivated to write this paper um, by um, the low recycling rates for and really developed countries, such as Germany, Spain, or Austria, um, we have the goal of 65% of recycling rates and um, or collection rates, and we are somewhere around 30, 35%, 40% when, when we have a good year. And on the other hand, um, we have in the future upcoming amount of smart devices, such as IoT devices, smart home gadget, or self-adapted systems. And we started our paper with the question, what happens to a smart device once it reaches its end of life as well? Um, what could we do with this? And to present our approach, we developed a short scenario, which I would like to present really shortly. Um, we have one owner, one owner, let's call him Tom or something else. Um, Tom is a really lazy guy. Tom has a smart home. Everything is fully automated. You have a couple of smart devices at home and one of his smart devices breaks um, after five years of using. So Tom, it's not willing to bring it back to, um, to recycling. Um, to a recycling center or something. So we said, okay, what if um, every smart device has an own depot site? For example, 25 euros. And the other smart device is now recognized by observing a smart device that one of the smart devices breaks and they can organize themselves over um, or so-called hitchhiking platform, it's a service platform where it can call it, um, the smart device, the smart home device, for example, can call another device and can call a third party logistic and so on. And um, brings it finally to a recycling center, called from the 10 to 5 viewers of depot site, of course. Um, so ju just really shortly, and um, we were mainly focused on the um, architecture and the behavior of such a platform and how it could look like. Um, 
which has um, our platform has three main components. Um, on the one hand, we have the blockchain component, which um, has the registration of all smart devices, um, the depot side in the background, and it also takes care of um, executing the smart contracts so that a machine or a smart device can deal with such another smart device or the recycling center and so on. Then um, we have the smart home, which is, of course have an observer component to measure um, the current state of all the smart devices. Every smart device in the smart home has a wallet so that it's connected to the blockchain. And we have the checking platform itself for uh, making the matchmaking between the smart devices so that we have something like, um, for example, transportation or recycling as a service. So. Um, Then we have the behavior, which is um, so you have the um, execution of the system engagement processes um, based on smart contracts. Um, as I see that I'm already running out of time, um, I will just shortly. Um, so it's divided in six stages, it's installation, negation, and so on. Um, for further details, um, later ask questions or have a look at the paper. and. Yeah, I would say um, that's all for my five minute um, pitch. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward for your questions later. Good, thank you. So uh, the third paper uh, is Gwen, if you could. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start. So thank you very much. I'm Gwen Salin. Um, this is a joint work with, uh, with some several colleagues. And this, title, this paper is entitled Seamless Reconfiguration of Full-Based IoT Applications. So um, IoT applications are not monolithic, monolithic applications built once and for all. Updating an IoT application should be carried out, carried out with specific care because um, this may induce incorrect behavior or inconsistency in the application. So in this work, we propose new techniques for supporting the reconfiguration of IoT application with the formal guarantees. So more precisely, this technique compares compare two versions of the application before and after um, a reconfiguration to check if several properties of interest from a reconfiguration perspective are preserved. So more precisely, we are interested in the three properties. So seamless reconfiguration checks whether remaining objects in the new application can reach their current states. Um, a reconfiguration is called conservative if the seamless property is preserved and if from the global state in which the reconfiguration is applied, the view that could be executed in the current application are still executable in the new application. And reconfiguration is called impactful if the seamless property is preserved again and if the world behavior of each new object can be entirely executed in the new application. These techniques are, have been implementing and are verified using the mode framework and have been integrated into the WebThings platform. So an IoT application in this work consists of a set of objects and a set of rules. An object is described using a formal model, an LTS, a label transition system, with actions or events identified respectively with an exclamation mark or a question mark. So as we use a simple rules-based composition language to specify the, the composition expression. A rule is triggered when one event is issued by a specific event and the reaction, as reaction, one action is issued by a, another object uh, defined as target. This rule can be composed using a higher level construct, for instance, sequence, choice, concurrent execution or, or repetition of, of rules. Okay, so let's focus on this simple example. Suppose that we want to replace application one by application two. So in application uh, two, the entrance, it's uh, an access control system, if you want. In application two, the entrance is control in order to limit the number of people in the, in the shop or in the room, for instance, to 10 people, let's say. So to do so, we keep both sensor, both sensor coming from application one, and then we add a, uh, an access control and a door. So uh, the access control is a software-based counter that counts the presence of customers, detects the, when the shop is full, and accordingly authorizes or restricts the entry of new customers. So replacing the first application by the, the second one corresponds to a, a seamless reconfiguration because the two remaining objects, sensor in, sensor out, have a single state, which is reachable in the new composition expression for any execution trace. This reconfiguration is not conservative as the bell has been removed and this behavior ring cannot be executed anymore. And this reconfiguration is impactful because the entire behavior 
of the new objects, control and door, can be executed accordingly to the new composition. All these checks are fully automated by uh, an encoding into the mode verification framework. So more generally speaking, regarding tool support, uh, Hermosar, the, cool, the tool is called Hermosar. It's built on top of the Win Things platform and it supports the design, verification, and the deployment of new application. More precisely, it, is, it consists of three components. One UI for designing the new application, one verification component for checking these uh, reconfiguration or consistency properties, and one deployment uh, component for deploying the new application, replacing the, the former application by the new application. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you have any question, of course. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, the first paper uh, is Ricardo. So please, Ricardo, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, we can see your screen, so we are all good. All right, perfect. So, um, well, it's a pleasure to be here presenting our accepted artifact uh, in a collaboration uh, between University of Brasilia, Chalmers and the GSSI. This is the title of uh, our paper, it's the Body Sensor Network, a self-adaptive self -adaptive system exemplar in the healthcare domain. During this presentation, I'll go quickly through um, the modeling of the BSN and what is the BSN within a intensive care unit example. And then we'll uh, go quickly through uh, how to execute the BSN. Um, well, to model and show what is the BSN, we'll use this example from NICU where you have a patient, which is modeled as a component providing heart rate, temperature, and pulse oximeter data. And uh, this data is collected by uh, a, collect, uh, a set of sensors, for example, the ECG, the thermometer, and the oximeter. And this data is sent, is, is sent to a central hub, which processes this data and is able to detect whether there is an emergency in, uh, well, with the patient. And this emergency can be triggered and uh, sent to medical facilities or doctors or nurses to act. Uh, in this paper, we present uh, three uncertainty scenarios that can be used. And most importantly, we also provide an uncertainty injector component, which uh, injects uh, failures using these four forms of curves, uh, the step, the ramp, or a random, and uh, finally an impulse. Well, using the example here of the um, uncertainty injecting failures for uh, the number of, of users increasing, we can see that, uh, and through our exemplar, we can collect data about the reliability of the system. And here on the right, you can see that uh, there are two decays on the reliability in these two points. Also, we provide a system manager which follows actually an approach that we presented on our on the last year on SIMS. And this approach uses uh, a, a strategy manager in, in two, that uses two components. One of the components uses control theory to um, well, adapt the system. So this is the key point uh, and most important. We here provide a file-based uh, system for configuring the patients and what vital signs they will be providing. Also, we provide six sensors and a central hub, uh, well, as I explained it. We also provide this uncertainty injector that injects uh, failures within four types of curves. Also, we provide this uh, managing system which can be used. Uh, the parameters here can be uh, tuned and it can be also substituted by your own uh, managing system. And in the knowledge repository, we provide uh, these uh, system logs that are collected during the execution from which you can plot the reliability and cost curves. To use the BSN is simple. You just need to go through to your, our GitHub 
And uh, well, there we, pre we present two options on how you can use it. The first one is by uh, downloading our virtual machine. Uh, we calculated and you can get it uh, running in 10 minutes. Or you can follow our uh, details instructions on building, executing, and analyzing the BSN. For that, we highly recommend that you watch our video uh, published on YouTube uh, that will give you um, other insights. So, well, thank you for your time. And uh, I am looking forward for the Q&A session. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you to all of you that you really kept your allocated time and you were actually even a bit faster. So that leaves us quite uh, some time for discussion. So I have been watching uh, the chat here and it seems that uh, uh, Danny has been very active, which I really appreciate. So Danny, I would say your turn and just uh, ask uh, uh, I mean all the uh, all the presenters or whoever you like so your turn uh, you have to unmute yourself now is good yes okay Sebastian I was as I wrote I was not it was not fully clear to me how your how your smart infrastructure let me say how it fits uh, self adaptation. Usually when we talk about cell adaptation, we talk about a system and then, then you have something that man monitors that system and it manages that thing. So what exactly, because it was a bit hidden in your, in your figure that you showed there. Sure, um, probably I didn't um, explain that really good. Um, we have the same understanding of self adaptation. We have a system that it's monitoring themselves or um, well in all, case, we have the idea that um, the smart device is monitoring each other and um, recognize when one of the devices reaches the end of life and maybe needs a repair or something so that this device can call for the other device um, that it recognizes, okay, it has a failure now or it's not even working anymore, it's not responding anymore. And when this case happens, it can call via our platform um, it can call, for example, um, the repair service for this device or um, where we for just focused in this paper on the recycling on the transportation service to the recycling center. So it can call um, autonom um, automatically um, the a service, um, a transportation service and take care of the end of life of this device. But that seems, if I may, that seems to be more like you observe that something goes wrong. You basically have an automatic infrastructure that sees that something goes wrong with devices and then you uh, automatically make sure that these devices somehow get re recovered or uh, let's say processed in, in, in at some station. But it is not really like closing a loop here. Eh? It's like only partially as far as I understand. Um, maybe pretty short, uh, but it's not just, um, it's um, taking care of everything by the end of this device. So I'm um, organizing the transportation process. Um, what, what do you mean by not closing the loop? Look, if you say, but I don't want to take too much time here, but your system is a, a smart IoT system then if you want to do adaptation, you monitor your IoT system, that's what you do. Something goes wrong, you take action, you say, okay, now that device that is, that it broke, it needs to be recovered. But when I think about the cell adaptation, then I would also expect that something happens in that system that you say, okay, for instance, I will repair it or I will, in whatever, I will remove, uh, I'll replace it or whatever. Uh, I uh, totally agree. So, uh, I, I totally agree. Um, that was not the focus here. We just wanted to demonstrate that it's possible. But um, in the future, we want to extend the system um, in line with the circular economy. And the circular economy of goods, of course, also um, their repair is more important than just replacing a system. Yeah. Um, so we were focusing on the technical proof, but I, I totally agree that it's maybe not that smart as it could be at the moment. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Denny, you can go on. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, are there nobody else who has to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like you, you, your next question was to Gwen. Ah, yeah, Gwen. <laughs> this is, I think, also some some other questions are related. So it was not fully clear to me here whether, I mean, I see your whole thing. You have a system in one, you have one configuration, you have another configuration, you want to make sure that certain properties are uh, are guaranteed before and after. But then I wonder how the, again, this is a bit similar question as the previous speaker, Sebastian. Is this something that happens at runtime? Is it, and also Thomas asked a similar question. Is there any, because at the, during adaptation, there is a transient phase or is it something you're just to offline and I mean to make sure if the adaptation happens that it is done correct, that it is, the result is correct. Okay, so no, this is a really good question. So what we're doing now is that we assume somehow that when we uh, start the reconfiguration process, that we, we freeze the current state of the application. Because for making, for computing this comparison properties, we need to know the state of, of the, the current application, the deployed running application. So this is a kind of strong assumption. So it's, but it's true that in the web things platform, for instance, you cannot stop, you cannot freeze object. So in the, in the current platform we are using, we cannot do that. So at the moment, so if there's a kind of gap between the verification, let's say, and the running application. There's an idea to, to do that, actually. The idea would be to, um, to, let's say, to store during the transient phase, you can store the, the events or actions that are, are going on in the running application, and then once you replace for the remaining object, you could play these actions or at least compute the target state in these remaining objects to move them directly to this state. But in, in the current form, in the current version of this work, we are not doing this. No, in fact, I, this, is, this, this reminds me to, in fact, a very uh, old work of Jeff uh, Kramer and Jeff McGee mm -hmm. on uh, quiescence, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then whatever, whatever follows up there. Yes, I, I remember those works. Like, not the details, I should say, but yes, maybe it's, it's, there's some relationship with these kind of results, actually. Good. It's uh, on papers in the 90s, but I have to check again. <laughs> Good. Maybe we continue with Thomas, uh, since he also had a question to Gwen. So, so uh, Thomas, if you want. Yeah, uh, sure. I think it was partially already answered because um, based on the presentation, it seemed to me that the properties refer to the system before adaptation and after adaptation, but not what happens in between. Exactly. Like we could also have properties of the transient phase that the adaptation, for instance, exceeds or... We can... mm -hmm. it's, it's, oh, yes, it's, yes, a partially answer to that. It's not what we are doing now. No, okay. it's not what we are doing. To tell the truth, we are just comparing and assuming that we are the, the, the running application is somehow in a frozen state, let's say, mm. and then computing those properties, comparing those two states. We could do that, actually, maybe using quiescence or other IDs. We could do that, but in the current version, it's not what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Danny, you want to continue with your question to Ricardo? Yes, the last question then from my side here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, should, it shouldn't be the last question. I mean, the last no, post uh, in the chat. <laughs> this was a very nice talk, Ricardo. I would like to hear a bit more because you said at some point you can plug in your own managing system. I like it. I wonder how does the monitor and actuator looks like? Uh, that would be interesting to know. Thank you, Danny, for the question. It's actually a very important to talk about the interface between uh, the system manager and the managed system, right? Um, in this work, it's important to say as well that we developed everything in ROS. So uh, we have as a ROS node, uh, a node called actuator and we have a, a probe node. This probe node collects uh, the messages that are going through uh, ROS topics. And uh, you can also uh, get information from inside the, other, the internal states of the, the other nodes, for example, the, um, the sensors that are operating there, the sensors are the central hub. From the actuator side, uh, yeah, we are receiving messages. Uh, yeah, we are receiving messages through a topic as well from the managing system. And this will trigger and send message, specific messages to all the other nodes which are the central sensors and the central hub. Um, 
this, uh, did I make it clear or? Yeah, I can, um, and I'm not so familiar with Ross, but uh, this in fact brings me a bit to what we, the previous discussion we had, also the issues that Thomas was mentioning that uh, may, maybe the problem is not complex, but in general, of course, you need to make sure that when you do adaptations, that you they, they should be done in a controlled way, that you're not updating state of components that uh, might create race conditions or whatever. Eh? So there is, I think, <clears throat> but of course, I can imagine that we have to look into the details to understand how to configure it and, and do it properly. Yeah, I hope that by, by reading our paper, it will be like uh, technically clear. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Good, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Sona, you, you had some questions to Charles, so can, can we uh, go forward with them? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, of course, Charles answered them already, but uh, maybe I could quickly uh, uh, summarize them here. So I was wondering if uh, you do fault localization in a sense that if you assess the source of that fault and take certain actions uh, based on the specific once like, a situation has been uh, marked risky. And I will continue and complete this question with respect to your answer in the chat that if that's not the case, I would like to know that the, the functionality, the current functionality of this decision manager you have, or basically what happens after you have identified a, uh, the current state as, as a risky. Yes, yeah, so to answer the first part, uh, like I said, uh, we, so we, we don't care with the, with the bow tie example I showed, you know, it was the uh, collision for an autonomous vehicle. And we don't try to localize whether uh, it was a pedestrian or another vehicle that might cause that collision. We just try to estimate the risk of a collision and then look at the environmental or the system factors that are causing that risk to go up. So for example, uh, you know, heavy rain can uh, interfere with our radar sensor and give us worse uh, sensor readings, uh, things like that. And so we try to understand what's driving it up, but not what the specific threat is that is uh, that's caused that might cause it. Uh, as for the decision manager, we have a very basic one so far. So th this paper was mostly concerned with simply calculating the risk dynamically. Uh, and then in the future, we want to look at more what we do with it uh, once we've calculated it. So we, you know, right now it's limited to, you know, if, you're, if your risk of a collision exceeds some predefined threshold, then we stop the vehicle. So it's very simple. Uh, but we want to look at things that are a little more interesting, like, you know, when to switch over to your backup. Uh, in our case, it was emergency braking or uh, also trying to plan a path uh, based on the estimated risk. Uh, so for example, with our autonomous car, we gave it, uh, we put it in a simulated city environment. We asked it to navigate from point A to point B um, and we kind of gave it a path we wanted it to follow. However, we might in the future want to consider different paths to get from point A to point B and then look at the risk we expect to see on each one of those three paths and try to choose the one with the minimal risk or do some balancing between uh, risk and other costs, like how long the path is, for example. Okay, so 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 I simply was was kind of a bit. Uh, uh, I was wondering regarding your example that you showed that okay, if you're detecting a collision as a possible collision as a as a risk, and then it really matters if that collision is with a moving obstacle and if that obstacle is moving towards you or moving away from you. So these are all could be ma marked as different type of risks that because it's also being handled at runtime, you, you might need to react to some in a more prompt manner compared to the other. But OK, that's that's um, something for, for future work. Thank you. Right, and, and I would add though that uh, at design time, we do consider that. So you know when we're looking at each barrier, we have different barriers, different control strategies for each type of, uh, of threat. Uh, you know, so how like so how you control the threat of a pedestrian versus how you control the threat of some stationary obstacle, for example, might be different. So we do consider that at runtime, I would add, but we don't uh, do any, you know, we don't try to localize and determine which particular threat is present at runtime. At least we don't do that yet. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we got some more questions here. Uh, so can we continue with Simos? Uh, you had a question? Uh, thanks. Thanks for an interesting uh, 
talk to I, I mean, my my question is really about the, the use of the volatile diagrams. Regard, so, you know, you, you know they, they are useful, but they can, you know, model only simple events, high-level events. Um, they, they don't have, they don't enable to, to model um, complex complex events or non-linear events, and they assume that everything is independent. So the question is really, you know, it's it's, it's a useful framework, but uh, does it support its needs? It, its needs, or what do you want to achieve using this runtime risk assessment, and how do you see the modeling complex events? Yeah, so that's a good question. And you know, like you say, uh, the bow tie is restrictive in that it's, you know, it's, it's a linear causal model. So um, it, like you say, it can't handle dependent uh, dependence between events, nonlinear events, and, and things like that. Um, so far, we found, though, that there's a large class of threats that, that fit into that linear causal model, and, and you can model sufficiently well with bow tie diagrams. Um, that's not to say that every event you know, can be that way. So the, that's a good, a good limitation to point out, and that it can't can't necessarily uh, can't necessarily model uh, every possible scenario you might come across. But like I say, we, we found that it uh, it covers quite a large range of them. So it would be interesting to look at what other types of models we might be able to use to to cover those those more complex cases where you need a a, a more rich modeling language. If I can follow up on that, so my, my understanding from the presentation was that there should always be a way to model mathematically these high level events, right? Mm -hmm. So do you do you think that's that's always the case, uh, or do you think that like something more like a hybrid uh, or a combination, as you said, with another modeling framework could could you know, provide this uh, facility to to extend its capabilities a bit further? Uh, yes. So uh, thankfully, it, it has been always the case in simulation, uh, but that's not necessarily true when you go to transition to the real world. So that's one another area of future work. If, if you have a chance to watch the full uh, 15 minute presentation is uh, we want to transition this to some. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the F110 competition, uh, autonomous race cars, essentially small uh, remote controlled cars. Uh, so we want to transition this approach from simulation to the real world and and that's when you know you may be able to provide a mathematical definition of a particular event uh but that doesn't necessarily mean you can observe it in the data your data may not be rich enough to to, to know when that event did or did not happen um, so in that regard i think that'll be an interesting uh interesting challenge as we try to transition to the from simulation to the real world all right thank you Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can we continue with Colin? You also had some questions. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, uh, I thought it was really interesting stuff. Um, and I don't expect you to have, say you've done this, but it's, a, it's more a question of how you think it might be approached. Um, about handling uncertainty. Uh, and in your reply in the text, you mentioned that sensor uncertainty. I was more in my mind thinking that the nature of these autonomous systems is they gain information as they go. OK, so especially in something like observing objects in the field of view, you can argue be, you become more certain or maybe even less certain in what you are seeing ahead of you. And I wondered if you'd given any thought of about how we could actually have evolving uncertainty and how that might be brought into the into the system. Yes. Uh some like like you say we haven't haven't done it yet unfortunately we're working on it now though um, there's so I showed the autonomous vehicle example here we have another example which is a uh, underwater vehicle but again it's mm -hmm. autonomous it's similar um, and in that setup there's obstacles we need to avoid underwater and so we have a, a you know world map of, of how the vehicle understands where the obstacles are and where its objectives are that it needs to get to to complete its mission. And in that world map, there's, like you say, uncertainty about uh, when we detect an obstacle, we, we will mark it on the map. But obviously, there's uncertainties on our observation. Like you say, as we get closer, we can narrow that down. Uh, so, so we have that kind of world map with this uncertainty in it. But how to really incorporate that into Resonate and give you some sort of 
you know, uncertainty bound or some sort of a confidence bounds on your, the risk estimate we provide. We haven't, uh, I haven't worked through all the details yet there, but that's uh, something we're actively looking at. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next seems to be Rogerio. So Rogerio. Sorry, sorry, Charles. My question is also to you. All right. Okay. So uh, nothing. Uh, um, just because uh, uh, your your talk in terms of of the safety, I think it it goes back to my previous work a long time ago. But one issue that all right, you've got uh, this this system which deals with safety in a very dynamic environment, and I wonder whether you have got the situation in which that system is able to stop itself when he's not, he cannot deal with, it, with, 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 with the situation, all right? So he gets a situation in which there is a discontinuity, all right? You reach a, a state, the edge of a state space in which you say, oh, look, I can't deal myself anymore, all right? That's one, one question, because this wasn't my, my initial question. Colin, I think you gave me the lead on this one. But my real question is how you fed this back to your design phase, all right? Because it's very easy, all right, to say you've got the whole this infrastructure and design, you spend a lot of time for insurance case, you spend a lot of time for both arm modeling, but I haven't seen no arrow coming back to the design in your diagram, all right? So these two questions essentially are related because, and the second one is related to the second, is a, is a motivation to the second question. Yes, yeah, so with the, well, with the second one at least, uh, about the, the feeding back from the runtime. That's one thing that, again, we're currently, so, you know, again, in five minutes, I didn't have time to go into detail, but right now we do all the estimation of the conditional probabilities at design time. Uh, and then we just use that information at runtime. However, one of the big things we want to do is as we get more data you know, at runtime as the system operates, uh, we want to feed that data back in and update those conditional probabilities based on that you know incoming runtime information uh, that's just updating the values in the bow tie diagram though it's not updating the structure of the bow tie itself i don't know if that's you know that sounded like you might be suggesting something like that is that true I think you're muted at the moment. Yeah, uh, that's precisely. That's precisely. It's not only a question of behavior that you should be allowed to to check, to adapt. All right, the the the, 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 the you have, it's not only the parameters of your model, but also the structure of your model. All right, because uh, I think uh, in, in in situations perhaps the the undersea more vehicle. All right, you might get into situations which, which we didn't expect essentially. All right. So, and this is very right. related to the fact that, all right, I cannot do anything now. What's happening in the situation? We, do we've got a protection for, do you've got a safety button there, essentially? Yes, and that's a, that's a very good question because it's, um, I think it comes back to a problem how we've commonly run into in the autonomous realm, which is kind of the completeness problem is, is how do you know you've identified everything? And I think the answer is you just simply can't identify every case ahead of time. So you need to be able to adapt at runtime. Uh, that said, I, we have not given much thought to how you would go back and update the structure of the bow tie diagrams. We thought a little bit about the assurance cases. So, you know, we have uh, uh, some work by uh, you and Denny and Ganesh Pai, if you're familiar, where they uh, did uh, dynamic assurance cases. So in that case, uh, you, it's kind of an idea where you have assurance case and you can dynamically update the structure of the assurance case as certain conditions occur at runtime. Uh, so we've thought about that a little bit and incorporating that with Resonate. However, we really haven't thought much about, like you say, what if there's maybe a new uh, event class, a new threat class we never thought about before. Um, for instance, uh, just in our example we showed, we considered pedestrians and other traffic, but we didn't consider uh, construction on the road, for example. Uh, and I saw actually just the other day that there was a Waymo autonomous vehicle that had a lot of problems with construction. A video came out, if, if any of you have seen it. Um, so how you would dynamically add in a new threat to the bow tie diagram is, uh, is a, a good question that I'm afraid I don't have a great answer to, but it's definitely an interesting <laughs> research topic. That's, that's great. Good answer. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. 
And did, did that, I kind of skipped over your, your first part of your question. Did that, no, 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 no. I think you connect both. All right. I think you're very clear. We say, you say you mentioned it. I think you, okay, great. Me, I understood uh, from the way I posed the question, I understood your answer. Great. Thank you. Thomas, you're muted. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> uh, no, no, I just wanted to ask whether uh, anyone of you has any further questions. Uh, so I, I wanted to say unmute yourself and chime in. So. <laughs> uh, nice. Anyone? It, I'll ask another if I may, Charles. Uh, just digging a little bit into what Ruggiero was saying there, I think we have the, a very challenging situation in many of our uh, self-adaptive systems when you don't have a stop safe um, and I, I, I wonder in in this case what you might do about um, conflicts um, so where we where we actually have you, you, I understand why you've constructed a fairly simple world it seems like a sensible place to start where we have the option of going or stopping but you can imagine um, the situation where stopping immediately also ca causes accidents, um, right? And 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 how this kind of how you might build in, um, as the, uh, uh, Simos has mentioned the complexity of the of the on the left hand side with the bow ties, but I can imagine the complexity on the right hand side becoming very uh, quickly growing, um, and where you might think that that would become problematic. Yeah, so I think that's getting into kind of the decision manager component, uh, which is, I think, very, very complex. It's not not trivial by any means. Uh, and so, like you say, the, the stop, uh, that's our contingency action for now. But even calling that a contingency action is really, like you say, that can be dangerous in itself. Um, so we've, we've thought about a few things. One that I think is really interesting, like I, like I mentioned before, is trying to predict if we have a few options for what to do is trying to use resonate and, and look forward a little bit and predict the risk from each, you know, say you have two or three options, you could stop, you could pull off the side of the road, uh, or you could do something else uh, is trying to evaluate the risk of each of those three. And uh, a, another group here, here at Vanderbilt that works with us uh, does formal verification. So they try to do reachability set analysis into the future. And I think that pairs very well with the resonate uh, so we're looking at how we can incorporate their reachability analysis with some of what we've done with Resonate and try to say, you know, if you have a few different actions that you're trying to choose between as, as your contingency plan, uh, can you try and project the risk for maybe the next two or three seconds for each one of those and then pick whichever one is the, you know, the lowest risk option or whichever one balances your, your cost factors the best? Yeah, so I'd say that's about where we're at with that regard. Yeah, great. I wonder as well if there's some value in closing the loop on this and seeing potential futures and what you can do about it in terms of data gathering. Um, yes, so yeah. If, if what's leading me to think there is a problem is this information on which I'm uncertain, can I gather more information which will allow me to make a better decision? Right, yes, that would be, again, very, very interesting. But unfortunately, uh, we, haven't, we haven't covered everything yet, so we're working on it. <laughs> Oh, once you've solved it all, then whether then we're fine. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, basically seeing this, uh, it, it sort of brings me to a bit larger question. Uh, I mean, this session is somehow supposed to be about CPS. And we know that, for instance, in CPS, the problem is that we uh, construct models or simulators uh, that, that we use to like validate what we do or, or experiment with. But at the same time, we, we kind of like know that there is a very, very huge gap between our simulators and the real world. And there are situations that we don't simulate, not because we don't, we don't know how to simulate it. We, we don't simulate it because we don't even know that such, such a situation exists, right? And then, then it's really like tackling the unknowns. So, so maybe just just a bit uh, larger question here. Uh, what what do you see, or what do you think, or or, or what are strategies to somehow cope with uh, uh, this problem in the CPS that we work with, that uh, 
there is this huge gap between the reality and the things that you you can do to validate things or or or, or etc. So so maybe we start with Charles. Uh, can we make this like a round? Yes. Um, you know, like I said, I think that uh, to some degree comes back to the the kind of completeness problem, which I don't think really has a uh, a good answer. Um, so I think the best from our perspective, at least the best we can do is, you know, try to monitor situations at runtime, uh, determine when something is outside of our understanding. So if it doesn't fit within our, you know, bow tie models or, you know, something is, uh, we use a lot of machine learning and uh, LECs. And, and so when those have out of distribution data, for example, so something you never saw in the training set is, is one strong indicator we use for if we're in a, a risky situation or not. Uh, I think it is essentially the best we can do at the moment and then try to take that information back into the design time and, and continuously learn from the new situation that you see uh, and, and incorporate them both, you know, into the, the data set that you estimate your conditional probabilities from, as well as incorporate them into the actual structure of the models as, as new events that we had previously not seen. Perfect. Thank you. Gwen, you, you, you want to... Just okay, just for me, it's, uh, it's difficult to answer this question, especially because in this work I presented today, it's exactly the opposite. We don't handle at all uncertainty. It's uh, We really need precise, well, not precise, it's kind of abstract, but even if it's abstract, we need some models. And uh, basically, our, our computations and checking and verifications are based on, on those models. And if we, are, if we don't have them, we cannot check anything. So it's... Yeah. I would say that in, in this work I presented, it's, it's rather the opposite. <laughs> we need <laughs> some you. kind of precise inputs. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And Tricaro, uh, your position on this? Um, to be honest, uh, I wouldn't have much to say from the from the perspective of the exemplar, but um, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. So it seems that we are getting too close uh, uh, of this uh, to this session. So if there are any leftovers, any any question that uh, wants to be a, the closing one, then your last chance. Otherwise, you can of course continue in the chat on the cloud. So anyone, just unmute yourself if you want. Okay, doesn't seem so. So in that case, uh, thank you very much to all of you, the presenters, the audience. Uh, Everyone was actually an excellent. I mean, speaking from my perspective, it was so, so good to see you and to be with you at least in the virtual settings. I'm enjoying it very much. And thank you. Thanks to thanks all of you. Thank you. Bye. So back to Rogerio, I believe, if you want to do uh, an organizational uh, announcement or whatever.